<laughs> good morning, His Place. How are you? God is good. How was your Thanksgiving? Hey, girl, I haven't seen you in a minute. How are you? <laughs> Can you stand with us? We're going to have a little relaxed service this morning. It's Testimony Sunday, Gratitude Sunday, Praise Report Sunday. We're just going to give praise to our God. I'm going to open with this verse in 1 Chronicles 16, 8. It says, give thanks to the Lord and proclaim his greatness. Let the whole world know what he has done. Sing to him. Yes, sing his praises. Tell everyone about his wonderful deeds. We're going to do that this morning. Amen. Let's worship our awesome God. Come on.
worship team for years. And you know what? He has an awesome testimony. Thank you, sister. Um, hi, uh, my name is Richie Wilson. Um, man, who, who likes this song? Right? <laughs> I love it, man. You know, it reminds me, uh, the Bible says to give thanks in all circumstances, right? And um, this past year for me has been no different. Um, you know, uh, all circumstances for me just means everything, you know? And sometimes we go through some valleys and sometimes we're on the peak. We got a lot of these ups and downs that we go through in life, you know? And, um, and sometimes it's really, really hard to give thanks when you're deep down in that valley, you know? And... Um, a lot of you guys know my testimony. Uh, a lot of my brothers here um, know what's been going on with me the last year. And um, uh, for those of you that don't know, back in March, I was involved in a dirt bike accident. And um, I broke eight ribs. I punctured my lung and I lacerated my liver. And from the time I crashed my dirt bike to the time I finally got help in a trauma center was eight hours. And um, they rushed me to the trauma center. And um, the doctor... Uh, told me what was wrong with me and um, he's like we got to get to work right now he's like I give you maybe five to ten minutes before you're dead you know and so they immediately went to work on me and they cut me open they entered a chest tube and they relieved all the pressure that had been building up for the past eight hours and all this blood leaked out leaked out of the side and um, all the air um, just kind of I, I got this big old uh, I could finally breathe again you know after struggling for the last eight hours and um, that's what saved my life you know and then uh, another doctor came in and he told me he's like you got eight broken ribs but I'm gonna put you back together you know and um, and I went to a, I went into immediate surgery <clears throat> um, the very next morning and um, you know uh, it was it was about that time where actually um, what happened was is you know I was on I was in I was in the bed for a long time I had eight broken ribs right and I was um, hospitalized for like five days but they released me and then I saw the doctor a week later and he's like hey you look good Wilson you know and um, he's like uh, come see me in six weeks, right? And they removed all the bandages for me. And when I saw him in six weeks, he goes, man, you look great. He's like, this is probably the last time you'll see me, you know? And um, he's like, I want, you, I want you up and at him as fast as possible. <clears throat> and I told him, I was like, well, I'd like to run. He's like, well, I want you running a marathon. And so I, in my head, I was like, okay, well then I got to get back to being normal as fast as I can, you know? And, um, and so I started working again. I started running, exercising, and I started surfing again. Um... Five months later, my wife and I went to go to Canada uh, to go um, visit her family, but also to go meet my godson who was just born. And um, we flew to Canada on a Wednesday night, um, and then I ended up in an emergency room uh, Saturday night. And I told the doctor when I got there, I said, hey, doc, get me out of here, man. I got a plane to catch, you know, I, in six hours. I got to go back home. And they came back with the uh, x-rays and the CT scan, and they said, you're not going nowhere. We're rushing you to the trauma center again. And they said, um, you have a hemothorax. And I said, and, you know, and all I had was a flashback of what just happened in my dirt bike accident, you know. And um, so they rushed me to the trauma center. And um, it turns out when I finally got there, they run a bunch of tests on me. They inserted two more chest tubes, one in my side and one in my back to relieve all the pressure. And the trauma doctor said I never should have gotten on that plane. She said it was definitely the plane flight from LAX to Calgary that definitely um, caused my lung to collapse again. And I ended up in the trauma center in Canada for nine days, you know, and... Um, so, you know, we, we couldn't fly back, obviously. I couldn't get back on an airplane, so my wife and I had to drive back home from Canada. And, um, you know, I'm talking to my buddy Jonesy. We, we call all the time. We talk to each other all the time. And uh, he, he calls me up one day. You know, he's like, hey, brother. He's like, I know you're going through a lot, dude, but I feel like I got something I got to tell you, you know, and it's something has been on my heart. He's like, you know, I, I know you've been struggling lately, and I know a lot of crazy stuff's been happening, right? And um, he's like, but I want to encourage you, like, like you have this time right now to, to take your time and to, and to press into, into the Lord and, and to use this time to, to get close to him, you know? And, and so I was off work for two and a half months. This happened in the middle of August. And you know what? I decided, you know what? Now's the time, man. And so what I did was I invested in my marriage. You know, and um, and God bless my wife because she supported me. She's been with me the whole step of the way, and, and you know, and um, you know, so what we did was we woke up every morning 
and we had a Bible study together, and we would spend two and a half hours together every morning studying the Word, praying together, and just investing in our marriage. You know, and thank you, man. And you know what? I got to tell you right now, like, my marriage is super strong, you know, and like, we're, you know, we just, I feel like this past year, I've been going through this crazy storm. Um, My dad passed away. My mom is battling cancer. I almost lost my life twice. But in the midst of that crazy storm, I try to, I got to remind myself that I have to thank God in that. You know what I mean? And it's, 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 it's easy to thank God when things are going good, but when things are going hard, you know what? The Bible told me to just, to give thanks in all circumstances, man. And I, I, you know, what I went through, I had to go through what I went through, but I know, you know, maybe you guys are struggling. You guys are going through some crazy stuff right now. I just want to encourage you, man, to try not to focus on what you're going through. Just try to focus on how good God is. And you know what? If God can get me through what he got me through, he can get you, you through it too. You know, so just thank him in that, you know, and he's got, you know, um, I'm good. <laughs> All right. We're good. I love you guys. Let's go. Yeah. Hell lost another one. I am free. I am free. Oh, yes. I am free. Oh, hell lost another one. I'm going to heaven. I'm going to heaven. I am free. Hell lost another one. I am free. 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 I am Sister Cheyenne, can you give her a hand this morning? Oh, yes. Cheyenne, she's just grown, grown so close to my heart. We're so grateful for her on this team. Last week or two weeks ago, she said, I'll share for you if you really want me to. I don't really want to. And I was like, okay. Okay, God wants you to get. He told me you should do it. She's like, all right, I'll do it. So she has something awesome for you guys. 
Uh, well, good morning, everybody. Um, if, you, if you guys don't know me, uh, I actually used to lead worship over at the Huntington Beach campus. Um, got some HB people in the house. All right, there we go. <laughs> All right. Um, but recently, back in July, God kind of called myself and my husband out, and it has been a journey, I'll be honest. Just lots of emotion, lots of emotion that I never expected, just with God, just whether it was just excitement for what's to come, sometimes a little bit of fear of the unknown, um, sometimes just worry, um, even just moments of just kind of a little bit of angry, just, God, what are you doing? Why, I feel kind of stuck right now. I just feel like I'm waiting and waiting and waiting, and nothing's happening. Um, but God really just kind of revealed some things in my heart, and I just, it was just nice to be transparent with God. It wasn't about ministry. It wasn't about anything. It was just me and him talking and being completely open with um, how I was feeling and where he wanted to go with, with me into our next um, next step. And there was three things that he kind of really spoke into me that kind of just keep repeating and repeating. Uh, the first one is obedience and obedience in the now. Um, I think Pastor Joe's mentioned it a couple times in his sermons and it's so important that we obey God right now with what he has in front of us, what he's given us. If we just keep going and going and, and we live in this world of just instant, instant this, I want this now, I get this now, you know, and God's like, no, I need you to obey right now with what I have for you uh, before I take you into that next thing. And then the next thing was just a heart of gratitude, really, uh, a heart of thanksgiving, a true heart of thanksgiving and just saying, God, Thank you. Thank you for the little things. I like to I like to complain a little bit. I like to see things like with the glass half empty, but God was like, no, I want you to say thank you. Just for even just getting up in the morning, having a job, getting to work safely. Uh, we take those really small things, just the breath in our lungs for granted without saying, God, thank you. Thank you for those little things. And, um, and it just kind of changed my perspective. It gave me that joy, the joy of the Lord, that peace that, that I really needed. Um, and then that third thing, which is still a struggle, you know, every day sometimes, some days are better than others, but it's trusting him deeper. Um, you know, I'm a very structured person. I like things in order. Um, again, I can do that five-year plan, no problem, and just go schedule by schedule. Um, but God was like, no, I'm going to take you out of that comfort. You've been there for six years. I'm going to pull you out. I'm going to stretch your character. I'm going to stretch your walk with me. I'm going to stretch your trust. I want you to see the holes in your heart that I want you to trust me with deeper. And um, it just really, really came clear. Some days, again, are better than others, but I just know that I need to trust him with whatever he has in front of me right now. Um, and so just an encouragement. I know at the end of the year, sometimes we kind of self-reflect on our year, whether it's in our careers or it's in some type of our life, relationship, finances, I mean, fill in the blank with whatever you can fill in and these hopes that you kind of expect for your life. But I think it's important to know that God's doing something now in each and every single one of us. Maybe it doesn't feel like, or maybe he's put something on your heart that he hasn't quite fulfilled, um, but he's still fulfilling something right now. And he's doing a ministry right now in your life and in your heart. And um, I just hope that you can see that. Um, I have a verse it's from the book of Philippians, and it says this in uh, chapter 1, verse 6, Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on till completion, until the day of Christ Jesus. And I just think that's so important. If we have breath in our lungs, we're still living each day, God has something for us to fulfill for his kingdom and his kingdom alone. Amen. 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 Yeah, I love the verse. I don't know exactly where it's from, but we're hearers of the word, and we also need to be doers of the word, right? And she just spoke that word over us. And I want to, like, activate what she just said. So can we just all close our eyes, and can I stretch you even a little more? And you just lead us all into prayer in those steps that you just are going through in your own life. And you apply it to what God is speaking inside of your heart right now. So let's just close our eyes and let Cheyenne lead us into that prayer. Father God, Lord, I just want to thank you. Again, a heart of gratitude, Lord. Whatever our hearts are feeling, let us change our perspective, Lord, for your kingdom. That everything we do is for your, your glory and your honor, Lord. We are nothing without you, God. And Lord, we just thank you that 
even when we struggle to trust, even when we struggle to be obedient in days, God, you are patient and kind and so loving. We don't feel unworthy, God. We feel loved by you, God. And Lord, I just pray that we would lay it all down, Lord. We would lay every single burden, every single want and need, Lord, before you. That you would allow us to see that we are vessels of your work, Lord. That you would continue to just continue to minister to our hearts. Allow us to be, again, Lord, a walking testimony. We all have a story to share. Let us walk in boldness and in truth and in love and in peace, God. We love you and in Jesus' name. Can you stand with us again and turn to someone next to you and say, did you know Jesus loves you? Did you know? And if they didn't know, tell them Jesus loves you. Just bringing them down, down, down. We've all been looking for a silver lining. Something to hold on to and hope's been hiding. I know a place you can go if you want to find this. Sing it out with me, church. But this is the good news. If you're breathing, it's for you. An empty grave, a life that's changed.
my children are my testimony. <laughs> if some of your kids are up here this morning, they might be your testimony. You guys can sit down if you like.
job, y'all. Good job. Good job. You guys did so good. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Good job, kids. We'll see you again at Christmas time. Yes, we will. <laughs> what a blessing it is. <laughs> well, we're going to transition over and continue our testimony Sunday. You get good with that? It's a little different. I know. It's like, it's like raw. It's super raw. I feel so exposed right now, being up here right now. But we have two more testimonies for you guys. Last testimony Sunday we had... Nobody signed up, which is okay. I know it's a little fearful, but we were worshiping, and Deanne was like, I'll say something. And I was just focused on the Lord like we should be. No, just kidding. <laughs> and she came up, and she shared her testimony with what she's going through. So I'm going to invite her up and her brother, Mike. You can give him a round of applause. Yes. <laughs> Number six, Kay. I feel na- Oh, do you want it? <laughs> I'll stand it. feel a little protection there. <laughs> um, well, you know, I just want to say, oh my gosh, uh, seeing my son and my granddaughter up here singing was such a gift. Um, it just makes me think this, we've been with Pastor Joan Trees in this church body since 2008. And this church body and Pastor Joan Trees have seen us through weddings. He married us. He married my daughter. Um, dedications, baptisms, tragedy. It's been an amazing. And so in July, we had another miracle um, happen in our life. Uh, For those of you who don't know our story, um, for 18 years, my brother uh, was he, he was disappeared. Is that a word? Disappeared. He um, was lost. We had lost him for 18 years. And, um, you know, for those of us who've experienced, you know, drugs and rehab and in and out of jail, it, it can separate us from our loved ones. So the last time I saw my brother was in 2005 when we buried my mother's uh, ashes or set them in the ocean. Um, so uh, just in uh, July, I just felt the Holy Spirit just really pulling me to search for him again. But I'm just pleading with God. I'm, there's no way I'm going to be able to find my brother. You know where he is. And so as a prayer, it's almost trying to find someone in the ocean. Um, and so one night, God was just pulling me to get on the internet. And so I did. And I was just sifting through trying to find someone that has that background. It's almost impossible. But I came across the this company that searches for people and you just pay $35. And the first thought, I didn't want to spend $35 in case it wasn't illegit, right? Um, And so God spoke to me and said, oh my gosh, girl, you know, you would buy a hot dog for $35 at an expensive restaurant. So give $35. Help me out. No, I'm just kidding. But um, so I did. And um, so I spent like a couple hours just sifting through this this, these records, criminal records, hospital records, um, where you, these people live and phone numbers, just lots of information. There's a lot of information out there about us. But um, so I came across what I thought was my brother, because there's a picture, a really uh, faded picture, but it, it resembled somewhat my brother. So I got really excited. So I kept on following it down because you can, it's like following rabbit holes. You can pick A, B, or C. So um, I came to the end of the report, and there was nothing useful but two more emails. And I thought, well, I'll just go ahead and s- send off two emails. And I wrote, hey, this, you know, my name's Deanne. I'm looking for my brother. I haven't seen him for 18 years. If this is you or if you know anything about my brother, because uh, we had thought my brother was dead because it was told to us that someone had witnessed him being shot. And so this was the fear that my brother's body was laying somewhere in a ditch. That really, I just, and so I just pleaded with God, please, before you take me from this earth, let, let me find him. Um, but God is good. Um, so I wrote the emails and I went to bed. And I gave it to God and I woke up to an email that said, oh my gosh, sis, I'm crying right now, period. And I thought, 
Okay, so I got excited. I, I received that hope. I got excited. I called my oldest brother and I said, oh my gosh, he's alive. He's alive. I just got an email. And so we wait, you know, I responded with my phone number, call me now. An hour went by, two hours, three hours, four hours went by with no response. And so my other brother was saying, look, I don't think, I think someone was just pulling your chain. I'm like, well, who would do that? I didn't want to give up hope. So finally, with like the fourth or fifth hour, I was cleaning the dishes or whatever, and I saw my phone with the with a phone number of Texas on it, and I got excited. I answered it, and it was my brother's voice. Uh, yes, and so and so uh, he got on a plane. And he came home, and he's living with us. And I tell you, it was it two days that my brother came to live with us off the plane. And I was sitting in this pew, and the Holy Spirit was just tugging at my heart to share this. And just pulling and wouldn't let go. And I'm so glad I was obedient in that moment. Because what I saw, and I share this with Pastor Joe, what I saw and if I, can, if I can share some, my brother has been alone. He shared with us that people think they know what alone, what being alone really feels like, but they have no idea. Like my, my brother was at the, the, you know, and I'm sorry if I, just utterly alone. No holidays with family, no, nothing. And so when, after we shared the testimony, I saw this church body love over my brother like he's never been loved before just arms over him hugging him and welcoming him I found out they gave him a nickname called Miracle Mike and he's never felt so much love and all of a sudden I just yes and I was just standing in the foyer right there and what God the word that God gave me was you know when we go up to heaven and when everybody comes around us to receive us into heaven, the love and the joy and the excitement, my brother got that in this church. This church. And it was amazing. And so since then, my brother, I saw, I have seen God just pour into my brother. He's in the word every morning. He's out of my, out in my backyard, just praying with God. And he'll come back and he goes, hey, sis, I think God gave me a word. He's telling me to go to Proverbs. And I'm like, and my, bro, my husband and I looked at each other. He's like, we're like wisdom. Like, you know, just like these, these and he's really speaking to him. So I want Michael to share. I did, but I just, I want. Is it my turn now? Oh, man, it's good to know I'm worth a hot dog. Oh, man, I, you know, I'm going to start off, you know, I'm back from the dead. Uh, I was dead, uh, not physically, but mentally. I didn't have no relationship with Jesus, no relationship. I was depressed, and I was lonely for the whole time. Uh, I tried looking for my sister, but she had been married a couple times, so I had no, no way. <laughs> Payback. <laughs> so, <laughs> hey, you can tell him. Uh, so, uh, anyways, I got her email, and it was very emotionally. Uh, the reason why, I, when I said I'm crying right now, I couldn't even see what I was texting. And I worked nights, so I had fell asleep, and I got up the next time and got to her email, and so I called her right away. I just really, desperately had to come out here to my family. I was out here within two days came to this church, and that's when my sister gave her testimony. And uh, so uh, Israel, I mean, the church really opened themselves up to me. I felt right at home. And I got into Mac. I started going to Mac. And then in August, which is a great class, um, where's DJ? He's not there. He just appeared on me. Anyways, great class. <clears throat> um, and then I was baptized in August. That's where my ride really took off. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> and I've been finding myself out praying and talking to God all the time. I, I, now I make his ears bleed now. <laughs> I mean, I just talk to him all the time. And he got to this point where uh, I, I'm overlooking the valley, uh, Palomar Mountain, everything. My sister's property is just uh, phenomenal. So I'm outside. I pray out there every day. 
every morning, all day long sometimes, I talk to him. And it wasn't like that until after I'd been baptized. And uh, he, he got to a point where he had revealed himself. And then as I'm looking at Palomar Mountain and everything, God's revealing himself and telling me that is a mirror image of him. All the beauty that we see, the sunrises, the sunsets. And then it all becomes, then it comes uh, the oohs and ahs and the wows. And the sun beating on your face, the wind blowing on your face, that becomes feeling. So now I feel him. And so uh, and then God, uh, right after that, I talked to him. I said, well, why can't I do this work and I can't do that work? As in reading your word for long periods of time. So he takes me to Proverbs. And not only Proverbs, but he instructs me on how to read Proverbs. And he instructs me in reading Proverbs. I am to read to this day and the next days. And so forth and so forth. And probably because he knows I'm dyslexic, I don't know. But it's, uh, it's been amazing, and I've been obeying, I've been doing it. If I miss a day, then I do three chapters. Uh, and then uh, another incident, these are just a few incidents. I mean, things were happening with me all the time with him. And I get this feeling when he talks to me, I get this feeling it's much stronger than your first love. I think it's like 10, 20 times stronger. And it's a feeling that I don't ever get used to. I don't want to let it go. I love hearing from him. Maybe that's why I talk to him so much. Because, I mean, he's, the gentleness that he has, the love, unconditional love, just everything, the trust, um, he'll never hurt me. And like I say, I, I see him every day. I see him every day, and I try to hear from him all the time. And uh, there was a time that something was weighing real heavy on my heart one day <clears throat> about me being there. I thought I was getting on my sister's nerves. And I'm trying to figure out a way to defuse the situation. And within five minutes, my sister comes out and asks for her forgiveness. And that, that was amazing. And so after we talked, I went down. And again, I'm, ta I'm telling him, thank you, thank you, thank you. The next day comes along, and I'm out there working. Uh, and I go, I can thank you 50 times, God. I can thank you 100 times. It's not enough. I want to praise you. I want to glorify you. So I go up to the house. I eat lunch. <clears throat> And so my sister pokes her head out and says, hey, Aurelia, I reached out to me. I'm like, yeah. She goes, she wants you to give your testimony. Already? <laughs> Boy, I mean, that quick. He's been doing a lot of work on me. And um, I went and I found it. I mean, my sister's email changed my life. This church has done so much for me. And, I mean, I've just been on this ride that I would not even expect it after I got baptized. So, and I want to tell, tell the church, thank you, and thank you for everybody for your love and everything else. I'm right at home. Thank you. Thank you for doing that. All right, we're going to have Pastor Joe come up and introduce our last testimony, a very special one this morning. Thank you. You know, she's my niece. <laughs> she's married to my nephew. So we go way back. Uh, uh, that was some cool sibling rivalry little thing right there. Did you see that? That's awesome. It never ends. Um, but, uh, you know, sometimes we have this feeling, this thinking that pastors live at some kind of different level of uh, regular people, if you want to put it that way. Um, and they don't. We're just people. You know, we... we we struggle, and I've shared it in our church, and one of the things that's cool about our church is we're authentic and we're real and we're open, and, and I've shared many times that, you know, everything a guy struggles with or has to deal with, I have to deal with. You know, I, I live that same world. And so um, I say all that because my dear friend Jarrett is going to be sharing his uh, testimony with us, and He's been a pastor and for a long time, and he's um, got life going on just like everybody else. But this guy blessed my, my heart. First time I saw him, I, I was introduced to him after church by Matt Rainwater. Some of you know him, some of you don't. But anyway, um, I looked at him. I go, man, God's not done with you yet, brother. God's not done with you yet. And uh, it's been months now. And uh, I love this guy. <laughs> and so, Jared Petro. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Joe. Um, it's an honor, and I'm blessed to be able to share my testimony with you. Um, 
it's been probably, um, as a pastor myself, for 23 years, I have spoken before, but this is real personal to me because it's my life when I share. Um, this is the first morning doing that um, in a, quite some time. So, um, by the way, if you have your Bible, I want to share scripture with you first in Psalm 13. Psalm 13. I'll read along here. It says, uh, verse 1, it says, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long will I take counsel in my own soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How long will my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Enlighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death, and lest my enemy has prevailed against me. Lest those who trouble me rejoice when I am moved. But I have trusted in your mercy, and my heart will rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. I praise God because I am grateful that I'm able to stand here today. Um, as uh, To kind of give you some past history, like I said, it's real personal because... You know, I was married for 29 years, and uh, I have four kids and two grandkids. Um, I was called at an early age into ministry. I was 17 when I came to Christ and walked with the Lord for many years and served the Lord in a variety of ministries in different churches. A few of those I'll mention uh, to you. Um, when I first was called of the Lord, um, I was, like I said, 17 years old. I was feeling like... God pressed upon me out of uh, this Old Testament book called Jeremiah where he was called as a youth and to take a stand. And I wanted to learn the Bible and be able to preach it and teach it. Um, but it's a different thing to apply it to your own life. And uh, what happened and kind of in a nutshell that I'm going to get to is when you walk with the Lord for a period of time and you could be in a ministry situation or at a church as a leader or like a police officer, for instance, where you're always hearing uh, through counseling the crime scene, right? You, you've heard almost every story. You get, you get the picture. You've, you've dealt with a lot of tragedy. You deal with great things. You deal with, you see a lot of stuff. You hear a lot of things. And there can be a dullness that happens and a drifting away from the Lord without even realizing what happened. The next thing you, you just know is that you're on the street and you lost everything. And it, 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 can, it happens that fast. And it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what title you hold or what position you hold. It can happen overnight. And essentially, that's what happened to me. So, a little history background is, like I said, I was married and uh, been divorced for a little while now. And I, with my wife at the time, we had served in ministry in 1999. I started ministry with uh, Pastor Chuck Smith at Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa. I was there for, um, from 1999 to 2004, uh, the first round being on staff there. And then I was doing youth ministry, college ministry, missions ministry, got the opportunity to travel to 72 different countries, uh, helped with Samaritan's Purse, with Franklin Graham, you name it, traveled the world uh, with humanitarian stuff. You know, taking the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ around the world to people. Um, great opportunities. Amazing. You know, different countries like Lebanon, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, you name it. Uh, Africa, Ethiopia, all around. Um, God had really done some amazing things. I look back at some of those opportunities and just to even do one of those things is a great thing. It's for the Lord, right? And God has shown me through my life that um, if you are surrendered to him and you let him lead, there is success. There is succeeding. There, there is a, um, a reward. You know, there, it's, it's great. There's nothing like it. However, after working at Costa Mesa there, um, I moved on and I went into a ministry uh, called Ocean Hills Community at the time, and they were in San Juan Capistrano. I served there for a short period of time. Soon left that, went up to the East Bay up in NorCal, and uh, was at a church called Cornerstone for a few years, uh, served on staff there, and then um, outside um, you know, San Francisco area there. Um, then I ended up starting a church in that area. It's a very liberal area, and so I really felt the need to get the gospel 
out into that area and lived there for seven years as a lead pastor and started a ministry. Then uh, I was called by a friend of mine um, uh, who lives in Albuquerque. He's a pastor. His name is Skip Heidzik. You've probably heard him on K-Wave 107. He's a great Bible teacher. Um, and he called me to come on staff as his executive pastor, and I did. And I moved out there and was out there for about five years, leading up to around 2016, right around there. Then God brought me back full circle, um, back on staff at Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa with Pastor Brian Broderson, who's there now. Calvary chapels have gone through different changes. I mean, most people know that. If you've gone to Calvary's, it could, you can feel a different experience in each one of them, it seems like. I'm not here to put down the ministry, but when you live behind the scenes of that and you're a part of a ministry, you know, we all have flaws, you know what I mean? And I used to blame the church for that, but I realize now that a lot of it was, it's me, (laughs) you know what I mean? And I'm part of that, and that's what I didn't like. So here's what's interesting. After leaving the ministry in 2019, um, I decided to go back to work and uh, into a trade um, that my father taught me was doing hardwood floors. And so I did. And during that time, my life began to spin out. My wife and I had been separated for about three years um, from 2019 up to 2023. And we divorced within that period of time. After that happened to me, I hit such a despair and such a low depression in my life. This psalm right here where it says, Lord, how long will you allow me to go through this? That I felt like the enemy was, I was such under attack. My family was being torn away. And and the moment I stepped outside of ministry, it was a strange thing. It felt like my whole identity was wrapped up into that position and that title or the glory of that or whatever, right? And God stripped it from my life. The Lord said, look, you, you really have left your first love. That's really what it was about for me. And the Lord said, you, you just have drifted. And the Lord also wanted to take out the things that shouldn't be there. And a lot of times, like when even Jeremiah was called, it says that God called him. But he's, he actually mentions like six things that he's going to have to do. Four of those six things are, are negative. They're like, you're going to root up. You're going to pull down. You're going to destroy. You're going to tear out right? It's like those four things, there's more of that that seems like happens in our life. And we're like, Lord, how long is this trial going to last? Why does this all have to, why do I have to be brought down to the dust? And I believe that God does it. I know for me and my personal life, I'm so grateful is he takes that out because it's, it's toxic. It's, he needs to rid us of our sin. And we don't even realize how much of us we have in us. You know what I mean? We're so prideful. And, and even in false humility, there could be, God wants to, he can bring us so low. And even when you think you hit the lowest point, and you know what I'm talking about, you could be in prison, you could be in a rehab, you could be, and lose everything. And that's where I ended up in my life. And I could stand there and, and look to, I was looking up to heaven thinking, Lord, how did I ever end up here? I didn't start out that way. I had a nice family, nice house, cars, all that stuff, right? But my life was defined by those things rather than the Lord. So the interesting thing is when he said, Lord, I don't, don't let my enemy triumph over me. I was so afraid to talk to somebody even within my own peer group because as a leader in ministry, if you fall into sin or, or something is going on in your life, unfortunately, sometimes there's nowhere to go or you're too ashamed to talk about it. And the shame and guilt nearly killed my life. I mean, I, there are suicidal thoughts I had. There were times that I was so fatal, I just wanted to take my life. I started drinking for three years straight. And I was like, I gave up. I was like, Lord, I felt like I served you. And I was like, I was wrestling with God. And God says, I need to rid this out of your life. And he did. And I want to share another scripture with you really quickly. It's over in Jeremiah. Um, It's in chapter 33. Let me turn there. This is uh, Jeremiah 33, 3, one of my favorite verses. Um, I actually have it tattooed on my knuckles. You can see right there. (laughs) I love it. Because it's a really personal thing. Jeremiah 33, 3 says, come or call upon me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things 
that you do not know or you don't understand. The beauty of that is that when we call upon the Lord, he listens. Look at that promise that he says, call upon me and I will answer. Now, we may not like the answer. It may be something we don't want to hear. And our, it might just blow our minds. If God was to show us what our future really is going to be like, it's outstanding. Obviously, in Christ, it's, we know the end of the story, right? We know there's a heaven. We know that the glories are to come. And when the Lord says, call upon me, it's got to be personal. I mean, we all, we all have cell phones. We carry cell phones. We have our top favorites in there, right? Like if your car got stranded on the road or you had a flat tire, you're, you're looking in your favorites to find that number of your favorite, whether it's your husband, wife, you know, son, daughter, grandma, who knows? But that call should be right there, 333. That should be the, the, the emergency number. Call upon me and I'll answer you and show you great and mighty things that you do not know. When we do that, the Lord, like I said, I know for me, I'm so grateful that the Lord showed me great and mighty things at a young age. But here I am at my age, at 52, feeling like, Lord, I don't like to start over. I feel like I've started over, all over again. And, you know, I was talking to Pastor Joe about this and meeting with him. There is such a struggle, the shame, the guilt, the feeling of letting down. There, I mean, I, I couldn't go to church. I mean, most of the people I know at church, they're, you know, I could walk around and someone says, oh, I've, I've heard you speak before at Calvary Chapel, or I've seen you on YouTube, or whatever. And I, I felt like I couldn't even get people my name because I felt so ashamed because I was divorced now. My kids weren't talking to me. I lost everything, went to three rehabs in a matter of three years. And the last one I was in, they, uh, if you get in trouble, which I got in trouble, um, <laughs> There's, yeah, we got a lot of stubbornness in us. We do, pastors. Um, anyways, <laughs> sorry. They make you dig a five by five hole. And I'm, when I'm not talking like, this is like a grave. It's like five feet wide by five feet long by five feet down. And it took me three nights. And so you finish your chores and your work that day. And they wake you up. You go to bed at nine. But they wake you up at 9.30. So just when you're starting to fall asleep, and you're exhausted because they wake up at 5 in the morning, you go out and you dig, and you get your clothes on, and you get dirt everywhere. Now, this isn't like soil here in Huntington Beach. This is out like in the desert. So you're like digging. It's hard pan, you know. It's hard. Anyways, I'm there, and I, oh, I'm almost done with the hole. And I'm standing in this hole, and I'm just weeping crying and I'm looking at the stars and I'm, I'm digging from 9 30 to 12 30 at night and then I'm waking up at five and then going to work with them and and I look up and I'm like how did I ever get here Lord how did I ever get here in my life right now how did this happen to me and right there the Lord said the most astonishing thing he said shut up <laughs> or listen up. He said, you know, be still and know that I'm God. You know, he said, I want you to be quiet and listen to me. You said a lot and I have spoken a lot. I've, you know, publicly spoke a lot. You know, I, I, I love teaching the Bible and the Lord said, now it's time for you to sit down and be quiet and listen to what I have to say. And honestly, that was all I needed. But I could tell you coming back to this verse, Call upon me, and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things. So this is what the Lord showed me. It's in Jeremiah, and it's the last scripture I'm going to share with you. But it's in chapter 18. Many of you are aware of it. You remember Jeremiah? He, uh, <laughs> he was in prison, too, just like Paul and like most of the apostles. You know, it's, it's amazing. Yeah, it's great. But Jeremiah, God calls him. And notice what it says in chapter 18, verse 1. So the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, the prophet, and he said, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause you to hear my words. Then he says, I went down, I listened to the Lord. That's all God has to say. Now, arise and go. Arise and go. You'll find that repeated in the Bible. Ar arise and go. And I love that because if God says arise and go, he gives us the power to do it. Like, remember the, the guy who was sick for 38 years and 
Jesus says, take up your bed and walk. He just commands. It's like power. If, if God says it, it can be done. So here's the interesting thing. Even in my own life, I'll, I'll finish with the verses here in a second, but even with drugs and alcohol and dealing with addiction through that time and, and the loss of this, just my life out of control is God gives us the power to overcome. And I knew that. And it, I felt like I just, okay, I'll just quit anytime. And when we play games like that with God, it's, it's a bad thing. It's not good. Because there, there are different words for sin in the Bible. There's iniquity, transgression, trespass. There's like eight of them. But the one that says no trespassing and we do this and we step over the line, that's the one where we're being idiots, right? We're being stupid. Because that's where we're like, we're playing with God. Anyways, with that said, God is faithful to give us power to arise and go. So he goes and he says, and I will cause you to hear my voice. So he went down to the potter's uh, field there and there he was. The potter was making something at the wheel and they'd spin the wheel, you know, put the clay there and start to spin it and make a vessel. They would, they would make a vessel by spinning the clay and the vessel he made. He says, of clay was marred, it was broken in the hand of the potter. So he made it again into another vessel as it seemed good to the potter to make. I love that. Because you know what? My life was shattered. My life was marred. And so is yours. And God can take any broken piece, any fragment in your life, and he can take it and remold it into a new vessel. He can take your life even right now, no matter what age. Look at Moses, 80, just starting out. Eight years old, the death of a child, anything that has shattered your life, God can take and reform. He'll take that and make it part of the story. Most potters just throw the clay away. Just throw the pot right on out. What do you do with a broken glass or broken coffee cup or whatever? You throw it out. We throw that stuff away. God loves broken things. Remember the woman who came to Jesus and she had this alabaster flask of costly fragrant oil. It was like a, like a whole year's wage. And she, before she put it on, her, on the feet of Jesus, she broke it. It was broken. And Jesus' body was going to be broken. You can imagine the foot of the cross. The fragrance coming off of Jesus' body was the fragrance of that perfume probably mixed with blood and water. Think about that. God can take a broken vessel like you and me and make it into something precious. And the fragrance of Christ comes out of us. But it has to be broken, shattered, has to start over. And God, here's the beauty. He makes it into something new. And that's why I'm sharing this with you. Because it's embarrassing for me to share these things. It is. And I don't want to let other people down. And Because, you know, you have godly leaders. You do. Men and women who serve the Lord. And God has reminded me, look, my calling's on your life still. Now I'm going to just use it in a different way. I'm going to use your life for restoration. I'm going to use your life because I broke it. And now I want to pour you out. And that's what God wants to do. That's what God wants to do in our lives. Amen. So I'm going to read this last thing and uh, pray over you guys. But this last piece of paper I have right here is, this was my daughter's. Um, she was in a private school um, back in 2012. And we were in Albuquerque, New Mexico at the time. And my daughter, London, wrote this. She was 13 years old. She's 24 now. She's happily married, and she's beautiful. She's got to spend Thanksgiving with her and her husband. And I'm so grateful God restores friendships and, um, you know, my, my relationship with my kids, you know. And I'm very grateful. But she wrote her own psalm. And I carry this in my Bible as a reminder. It's a dad thing. <laughs> but um, I'll start reading it. Listen. My rescuer and my salvation. Lord, you will never forget me. You'll never forsake me. You are my rock. I will stand up for you, my God, my healer, my protector. You have never left my side. You are the creator of the universe. 
you made everything perfect. If there was no you, then I would be nothing. 13 years old, right? You are holy, worthy to be praised. Help us not be hidden and help us to stand up for our faith. You give me power, power to do anything for you. You help me to finish what I start, Lord, and I am committed to you. So let me just say, beautiful psalm. I love it. I'm going to put it over my hair in my Bible. I like when you play that music. So it's cool. <laughs> so um, I want to pray over you that you would be moved to hearing after these our testimonies that you would write that to the Lord. You can write it down in a journal. You can, if you've ever done that, maybe God is challenging you to that. But listen, your life is being written out by God anyways. And to be able to thank God, I, w- I was telling my friend, Michelle, I said, you know, it's amazing to me to be able to be in a service just to hear testimonies, just to, just to hear what God is doing. Now, I feel like I know that individual a little more and I know their name. And imagine if each one, we're going to do this in heaven anyways, we'll know everything about each other. But it's amazing because you, you see what God is doing. And I love that. But I want to pray over you. But that last part, Lord, I'm committed to you. You know, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news is that Christ took all of our sin, all of it, personally, all, everything. And he, and he took that, and he bore it upon himself, took the judgment of the Father, the wrath of God the Father himself. And Jesus went to that cross and died for our sins, all of them, every single one, even the ones you're going to commit tomorrow. Amazing. All for mankind. And you know what? The Romans says that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, but the Father rose him again, he rose from the grave, didn't stay there, that cross is empty, right? That's the victory. The victory of the sin being forgiven is one thing, but he upped it. He's like, now you're a co-heir with me in heaven. You're my son, you're my daughter. It's amazing. That's the free gift of, of that's the gospel. When Christ died on the cross, he says, if you confess me. So I, I've just kind of come up with an ABC formula, if you will. If you agree, believe and confess, and you can commit yourself as well to the Lord, that's committing your life to Christ. That's what that means. This is why service is done. This is why testimonies are given. This is why the church even exists is for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when you would agree with God, what he said about himself and what he said about you, that's easy. I know I'm a sinner. I know he's a savior. Then I believe. I believe and, I, and I'm still learning to believe. I'm, I'm living it. You're living it. He takes us little steps by little steps, believing in the gospel, the light that lights the way. And then we confess him as our Lord and savior. But it doesn't end there because I did that for a lot of years. Now, was I saved? Yeah, absolutely. Did I sin? Yeah. Did I, did I screw up? Yes. Did God restore me? Yeah, he is. Amen. Yeah, he is. Listen, if you've never done that before, you've never agreed, believed, or confessed, you can do that right now. Would you like to do that? Anybody here want to do that? Why don't we all stand and I'll pray. <clears throat> Father, I pray that, um, that you'd move in the hearts of everybody here, that you'd restore and bring healing to broken relationships, fractured minds, fractured hearts, torn apart, feeling unworthy, the loneliness, Lord, the silent scream that we all have within us, crying out day and night, sleepless nights, restlessness, despair, depression, even suicidal thoughts. Lord, I pray right now that you would take all those negative things, take it to the cross. I pray, Lord, that your power, we would arise and go. We would follow you. You would bring that healing to our lives. Lord, I pray for anybody here that hasn't committed their life to you, has never really understood what it meant to agree with who you are and who they are and how you view them. And and they want to believe today. Lord, I pray that you would move in their heart and that you would cause them to cry out to you, to call upon you, Lord, and knowing that you're going to answer and you're going to show them great and mighty things. Lord, I pray that the good news of Jesus Christ 
that he's alive and we will be with him forever, that his life is in us by his Holy Spirit. Lord, would you, I pray that your Holy Spirit would fall upon us. Lord, that we be baptized by your Holy Spirit for power and glory, to bring you glory to your name. So Lord, I just commit my friends, my family, extended family to you here at his place. And Lord, would you do that work now? I pray in Jesus' name, amen. I just want to go ahead and have a seat. We got a few minutes. I just want to share one thing, and I know you noticed it. There are two things God does in our lives. Well, he does many, many things, but there are two real key things. How many saw his pastor thing kick in, you know, in his testimony? His, you know, why? Because that's the gift God gave him. And you all have gifts. The gifts we are told in scripture are without repentance. He doesn't give the gift and take it away. He gives the gift and the gift is for others. It's something he gives us that we may re-gift and, and that gift becomes a blessing to others. And so he blessed us with his gift. The other part that God does in our lives is character. This is where he does an inside work in us, where he has to strip away, whether you're a pastor or whether you're living on the street, there's stuff inside of us that's not right, that doesn't line up with God. And he doesn't, he, he wants to heal and deal with that and to make us men and women who are aligned, that are gifting aligns with our character and when we get out of character the gifting is still there but God's got to do a work in the character and when they line up it's something new for us what my brother has gone through will create an ability to help others who have been wounded in the same way who have acted out in the same way. When we get restored of things in our life, it makes us restorers. And so we can help others because we know, we know the low, we know it all. And so what we oftentimes will think is a punishment in our life. Our failings are a punishment and God should have spared it. It's no, no, it's actually a work that he's doing in us so that the gifting becomes even a better gift. And so that's what's going on in his life. That's what's going on in your life. That's what goes on in all God's kids' lives. So, and, and oftentimes that character is pain, the character building is painful because why it's painful? It, it always incorporates failure. We didn't, we just aren't what we thought we could be. We fail. We didn't, you know, there's not one person in here that ever got married thinking, man, this is going to end in a couple years. You know, we think, we think we have all our imaginations of how things are supposed to roll and things are supposed to flow. And God, God does what he does because he, and, and this is where our maturity in character takes place is that even though I'm at the low place, God is still in the high place. And the God in the high place still has a purpose. And that purpose isn't done till I'm done. And so starting over is part of the journey forward. So I want to open up this altar in the last couple minutes. That if, you know, you think a couple things he said really hit me. One is how long, Lord. If you're worn out from waiting, how long, Lord till something changes, till, till an, a dream comes to pass, to something I've been waiting for and I'm just tired of waiting. You need, you need to be refreshed. You need to get to that place where you have joy again in the journey, not joy when I get to the destination. Because if your joy is based on the destination, you'll never have joy. Joy has to be found in the journey. 
And so perhaps that, and then another, another place we can be is, Lord, I've lost so much. I'm in, I'm in deep, deep pain. And I need to be comforted. It's, it's a beautiful thing because Jared and I meet and, and there are other people. We need other people in our lives. Because, you know, being a pastor, it can be lonely. Especially if you mess up. Because you're looked at with certain, you know, it's easy to judge them. Uh, it's easy to judge, judge guys and girls, gals. <laughs> I didn't say chicks because that's what I normally say. But I refrain from that. And uh, <laughs> so you didn't hear that. I'll, I'll do the Spock thing. You don't hear, you don't remember anything. Anyhow. Don't give up. Don't give in. And, and scale your life back to today. Just God, let me trust you today. Let me, let me walk the walk I have to walk today. Especially if it's the walk I don't want to walk. I don't want to walk. Or I'm tired of walking. I've been walking it so long. Scale back just today. We can all muster the faith to follow today. And that's all you'll ever have to do is today, now. As Cheyenne said, the now is the only thing we'll ever have to do. Other than uh, everything else is in his hands. Great plans are great, but it's still his. So let's, so this will be open. If anybody needs prayer, you want somebody, we got people that will pray with you. If you're in a place of struggle, we will definitely want to partner with you in prayer. And for the rest of us here, you're out three minutes early. Consider that a great blessing in your life because it's a rare occurrence at his place. So be blessed, my brothers and sisters. Have a great day. Thank you for sharing all the people that shared. And uh, Lord, do your will. Have a great day.
he picked me up and turned me around how he placed my feet on solid ground it makes me want to shout hallelujah thank you jesus lord you're worthy of all the glory and all the honor and all the praise it makes me 